We're back into the Roots series, uh, digging deep through Genesis 1 through 3. Now, uh, and I heard last week was great too. DRC came, my good friend um, from Kingdom, Kingdom Garden, and he does a home church, and he's a, he's a good brother. So I'm, I'm glad uh, he came and spent some time with us last week. So today we're going get, to get into Genesis chapter 3, and we have uh, covered the first two chapters in Genesis we're going to do this week and next week to finish off chapter 3. So the first two chapters of Genesis, we have really gotten in some great subjects. Things that I have found to be very nourishing. To, to, uh, to, to, to These are like the basics of good life, right? The Word of God, the image of God. How do you live without these things? The rest of God, the work of God, the gift of God called companionship. These are like the mechanics to a well-lived life. You got to get the mechanics. If you don't get the mechanics down, you're not going to be uh, uh, very successful in life. You got to get the mechanics. But there's a whole nother dynamic to consider. You can get the mechanics uh, to anything, but you, you, you have this whole other dynamic. It, it's kind of like sports. You can get the mechanics down of, of like throwing the ball you know, I'd love, to, uh, play, I'd love to play a catch, you know. You got you to gotta spin it just right to get that nice spiral on it. And then you got the mechanics of catching the football. You got to catch it with both hands, look it in, right? And then uh, dribbling the ball and, and shooting the ball, Don, right? Th these are good mechanics. You got to get the mechanics down. Um, and you can get really good at them until... You find there's actually somebody trying to stop you. There's a whole nother dynamic. See, I grew up uh, shooting a lot of baskets, playing a lot of catch, and I got pretty good at these mechanics until I realized uh, there's a whole nother dimension to the game. I turned out for uh, seventh grade basketball, and I didn't make the team. But I thought I was really good because I was good at the game of horse. I could stand all over the court and sink shots from all over, and I can beat people at horse. But once I got into the court, there were people who were taller than me, who were faster than me, who were trying to stop me. And needless to say, I, I did not make the team. So I had the mechanics down, but having the mechanics alone was not good enough. I needed to know something about the opposition. So the first two chapters that we have looked at so far are the mechanics. There has been no opposition up to this point. Genesis 1 and 2 are the perfect chapters in the Bible where there is no death, no sin, no disease, no enemy. But these are the mechanics of life. These, these things that we have talked about, the word of God, the image of God, knowing that you bear the image of God. That other people bear the image of God, that they're loved, they're valued. Living on the word of God, living with a sense of dignity that you are creating in his image. Recognizing that there's a, such a thing called rest. Entering, in, in, entering into his rest, rising from the rest to join God in the work. And then not doing it alone. Bringing people alongside. Who's on your team? You need companionship. These are the basics. And if you're going to try out for the team, you've got to master the mechanics. You've got to get these things down. But there's a whole other dimension to this thing called life. And that's what we're going to explore today. We're going to get a good look at, in chapter 3, our opposition. And his name is Satan, and some people uh, refer to him by the name of the devil. First uh, Peter uh, chapter 5 says, Be sober-minded, be watchful, be serious. Your adversary, the devil, prowls around like a roaring lion, seeking whom he may devour. And Peter says, resist him. Be firm in your faith. You have an adversary who is trying to stop you. Get the mechanics and get them good, but also realize 
You have an opponent. Paul says in 2 Corinthians, he tells us not to be outwitted by Satan. Satan Satan is trying to outwit you. Don't let him do that. And he says here, for we are not ignorant of his devices. We are not ignorant of Satan's designs. Because we have passages like what we're going to study today. Genesis chapter 3 will get us acquainted with the devices and the designs of the enemy. And this is a great chapter, or this this is a great passage, because it introduces us to the idea of how sin and death came into the human experience. This is good that way. But it also serves as a pattern for how our enemy operates. So Genesis chapter 3 is going to be a great, it's not going to be an exciting study, but it's going to be an immensely helpful study. And sometimes it's good to study your opponent. Right? It's called scouting out the opponent. If you play basketball or baseball or football, and if you do it at a high level, you're likely going to want to sit down and watch some film. You want to you get some tape on your future opponent, and you want to study game film. This is what these guys do. They sit down and they, they study the game film to determine what are our, what are our opponent's tendencies. What are their weaknesses? Where do they crumble? Where, where, where are the, what are they good at? And can you imagine? Well, first of all, you know the enemy does this on you. You know Satan does this on you. It, it, it's mentioned in the book of Job where uh, Satan approaches God, and it's suggested that, uh, that Satan has considered Job. He has contemplated his ways. He has studied him, and you know he does that on you. So can you imagine showing up for the game? It's game time, and your opponent has studied you, and yet you have not studied him or her? You're going to be caught off guard. You're not going to be prepared. You're not going to have an advantage. So today, as we go through this passage, uh, we're going to be studying some game film. We're going to explore the tendencies of the enemy so that we're not caught off guard. Because, uh, folks, this is life or death stuff. The life that we're living, the spiritual life that we're living is, this is serious stuff. So we got to be good students. And the Bible helps us out in really finding out what we need to be prepared for in this thing called life. What are some of his tactics? What are some of his tendencies? So we're going to break those down today, and we're going to analyze some game film. So Genesis chapter 3, okay? Genesis 1 and 2, we talked about the mechanics. Today, we're getting out the game film. And we're going to read this passage today, James. uh, James. Genesis chapter 3, verses 1 through seven let me read it to you and then we'll break it down hear the word of the lord now the serpent was more crafty than any other beast of the field that the lord god had made he said to the woman did god actually say you shall not eat of any tree of the garden and the woman said to the serpent We may eat of the fruit of the trees in the garden, but God said you shall not eat of the fruit of the tree that is in the midst of the garden, neither shall you touch it lest you die. But the serpent said to the woman, you will not surely die. For God knows that when you eat of it, your eyes will be opened and you will be like God, knowing all good and evil so when the woman saw that the tree was good for food and that it was a delight to the eyes and that the tree was to be desired to make one wise she took its fruit and ate and she also gave some to her husband who was with her and 
he ate. Then the eyes of both were opened, and they knew that they were naked. And they sewed fig leaves together and made themselves loincloths. This year marks the worst moment of human history. This is what we term the fall. And oh, what a fall this was. And I'm giving away my age a little bit here, but uh, I grew up watching ABC's Wide World of Sports. And uh, it, it, was, it was a show that aired through the 70s and 80s. It was my f one of my favorite programs. You're going to have to forgive me. I have a lot of sport illustrations today. But the Wide World of Sports was one of my very favorite. I don't know, I played like Saturday afternoon or something like 2 o'clock. And I was so excited. And uh, the first line uh, of that program, I don't know if you guys remember, is Jim McKay, great announcer of the day. Uh, he said the, the line, the thrill of victory and the, and the agony of defeat. And then they would show this image right here. You guys remember this? Talk about brutal. The thrill of victory and the agony of defeat. That right there is a good picture for what's going on right here. We got the agony of defeat. This, this is brutal, but this, oh, this doesn't even compare to what's happening here. Adam and Eve and all their descendants, means us, took a terrible fall. And as a result, Death entered into the human race. Didn't have it before. Didn't have sin, right? Because God said in chapter 2, verse 17, guys, you can eat of all these trees, all of them. But don't eat of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, for in the day that you eat of that tree, you shall surely And so they ate of the tree, the very thing God said, don't do, and you shall surely die. This is a moment where death was inserted into the narrative. We didn't have it before. Death is one of the worst things. It is the worst thing that we face in human history and everything that comes along with it. And the moment they took the fruit, the process begun aging disease sickness brokenness sever severed relationship with god everything took a terrible fall so as a result death entered into the human race and that my friends is the very reason the son of god came into the world to pay a price, to take your place. He said it would come. They did it. And instead of having they, them pay their own penalty, Jesus came and he went to the cross for you. So anytime you look at the cross, you should always see yourself or the idea that that should have been me. And yet Jesus took my place. And he paid my penalty. That thing belonged to me. But that's called substitution. And that's the joy of the gospel. So today, uh, we're going to study some game film. Jesus has rectified this situation. If you find yourself in Christ, you find yourself in life. Eternal life. Because he took your penalty however our opposition is still active today he is still trying to trip us up he is still trying to get us to take these other falls 
And st- sin still comes with its consequences. And so it would behoove us today to watch some game film and learn from what the serpent does in this passage and what the woman does in this passage. Because we still face this age-old tactic called temptation. The enemy employs temptation. He doesn't overwhelm. He doesn't overpower. He seduces. He tempts. And we got to be aware of his devices. So uh, we're going to note four things in this passage. And here's I always like to try to lay out the structure of the text. And then we're just going to work through that. So we're going to look we're, we're going to look at four things. And they all have to do with uh, this thing right here. The word of God. Everything we're going to talk about today has to do with this gift we have called the word of God. This is the mountain that we will live or die on in regards to temptation. This right here, right here. So uh, let's look at these four things that led to this defeat. Okay. Number one is a serpent undercuts the word. We're going to see that. The serpent undercuts the word. Number two, the woman overshoots the word. Number three, the serpent contradicts the word. And in response, the woman and man sidestep the word. But it all has to do with how you handle this thing right here. The word. You do these, you do these four things and it's a sure Recipe for disaster. So number one, let's start working our way through this. Uh, Let's look at verse one. And look at the serpent who undercut the word. It says here, now the serpent was more crafty. He was more crafty than any other beast of the field that the Lord God had made. And he said to the woman... Did God actually say, you shall not eat of any tree of the garden? Oh, crafty. Notice his first point of attack is against the word of God. Did God actually say... He starts to put a little bit of a doubt in her mind, gets her to second guess what God did actually say back in verse uh, in chapter uh, chapter two, verse 16 and 17. Chapter two, verse 16 and 17 are critical in understanding this whole piece and the whole Bible. Okay, mark it in your Bibles. Chapter two, verses 16 and 17. That's the point of attack that the serpent is trying to make and he undercuts it. He gives her a reason to doubt it. The devil is going to try to drive a wedge in between you and this thing right here. You know, his word is his word to you. And the devil is going to try to get in between you and the word. So that means you got to know it. (laughs) You got to know it. You cannot have a casual relationship with the word of God. So the serpent was crafty, the scripture says here. He was cunning. He was he was shrewd. Second Corinthians 11 says that the serpent was subtle. Subtle. Look at this. uh, I got this next slide here. That should uh, tell us a little bit about what subtle means. Subtle. If you look at this. Get that next thing? Okay. That's a, 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 a color scheme, right? A grayscale color scheme. And if you look at each successive step or each bar, and if you just take two adjacent bars and, and, and compare them, the, the differences are fairly subtle. So if you just to look at the two, and you, you probably at first blush or first glance look at it, it's like, oh, there's not much of a difference there. That's what you call subtle. And that's how the enemy likes to move us along. He doesn't take us from white to black. 
He takes us from one degree to the next. Subtle steps in the wrong direction. And pretty soon you're over here comparing dark gray to black to yuck to muck. And when you started over here and you never knew how you got over here because he led you along a subtle path. This is the nature of temptation. You know, we get a lot of the, the images from popular, popular media of, of the devil who comes in this red suit and horns and pitchfork. And, and he comes and, he, and he's scary. I don't think he's like that at all. The Bible says he masquerades himself as an angel of light. He comes with beauty and charm. And he seduces and he makes things so nice and reasonable, rational. And that's what he's appealing to here with the woman. He's, being, he's trying to be rational, but he's being very subtle. Temptation usually happens this way. Got the next slide here. Talking about subtle. I mean, you can't see much of a difference, can you? These are called spot the difference. And right off the bat, you, you can't see. There's, there's, it's the same thing. The enemy would like to offer you the same thing God offers you. Just a little different. He knows the word just as well as you do it, but he twists it. He probably knows it a little better than you do. But he twists it just enough where you can't see, you can't discern the difference. Look at the next one here. These are all, these are all different. But you got to look closely. See the uh, buttons over here? There's two buttons over here. There's only one button here. There's some snow on his nose over here. There's no snow. On, so, you know, there, you, you, but you got to spend some time. Okay. Next slide. Same thing. It's the same thing, right? No. The enemy wants to offer things that's just a subtle shade different. Because he's crafty. He's cunning. He says, did God actually say, you shall not eat of any tree of the garden? No, God actually said, why don't you show that next slide here. This is what he, God said over here. You may surely eat of every tree of the garden. He adds a prohibition. He says, but uh, don't eat of this tree because in the day that you eat of that tree, you shall surely die. You can eat of all these trees, every tree actually. Just don't eat of this one over here. And then so the enemy comes and says something very similar. You shall not eat of any tree of the garden. He's, he's uh, exaggerating the prohibition. The guy said, don't eat of that tree. You can't eat of any tree. But he uses the same language. It's subtle. And it's a question that's even hard to answer. How do you give it? So it, this is his method. He comes in to undercut the word. So you got to know it. You got to know it. By a sleight of hand, he makes God out to be a tight-fisted ogre. When it really is quite the opposite. God says you can have it. You can have every tree. You can't have any tree. He's, he's, he's holding out on you. He, he's being self. He, he's, he's just holding this to himself. You can't. He's just tight-fisted. Couldn't be further from the truth. And in response... The woman overshoots the word. The servant undercuts the word, and the woman overshoots the word. So the servant asks Eve this question. What was her answer? Did she get it right? Yeah, she got it right. Look at verses 2 and 3. She got it exactly right. Didn't miss a word. She, she doesn't fall short of anything that God says. But she does go beyond what God said. Look at it here. Verse 2. Look at her, her response. And the woman said to the serpent, We may eat of the fruit of the trees in the garden, but God said, You shall not eat of the fruit of the tree that is in the midst of the garden, neither shall you touch it, lest you die. That additional statement, neither shall you touch it. Did God say that? 
I don't, I don't see that back in chapter 2, verse 16 and 17. Neither shall you touch it. It's interesting. No doubt this was well-intentioned. I mean, she was saying, hey, we're, we're not supposed to eat that thing, so, hey, we may as well not even touch it. So she builds a, a tree around the fence. Or, uh, the tree. Sometimes I do that. There it is. She builds a fence around the tree. She built a tree around the fence. No, she builds a fence around the tree just to be safe. Just as a precaution. We're not supposed to eat that thing. So we may as well not touch it. So she goes beyond the word in an attempt just to be careful. So she doesn't fall short of the word. She just goes beyond the word. And this is where we need to be careful. This is what I would call, at times, a spirit of legalism. A spirit of religion. The Pharisees were known for doing this. I mean, they had so many additional laws. Now, the Pharisees get a bad rap because Jesus, you know, uh, he was all grace and, the, and, the, and the, uh, these guys were all legalism. But the, 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 the intent for their heart was is that they wouldn't be kicked out of their country anymore. They had already experienced exile to Babylon for disobedience. So they were back in the land this time and they weren't going to let that happen again. So in order to safeguard the law of God, they built fences around the law so as to protect the law. So had, they had up to uh, 613 additional laws. They went beyond the word. They didn't fall short of the word at all. But their heart was, we don't want to disobey and get kicked out of the land again. We want to follow God. And so they developed all these fences, 613 of them, to protect the actual law that God had given. And so they became very strict. They burdened people. They created this false sense of this, this false standard of righteousness. They, they created uh, something that even looked like a judgmental spirit because they were saying, don't do, you can't do, no! All the time because they wanted to protect something very sacred. The Sabbath was a big deal to them. So they created additional laws. This was the spirit of legalism. They went beyond the word. We can do the same thing today. In times past, you guys, you know, we've all grown up in the church and around the church. And sometimes, you know, we've, we've come across things like, man, the church, man, it's just like, well, remember back, no makeup. When I was a kid, you were, as a woman, you're not supposed to wear makeup, right? You're, you weren't supposed to wear pants, right? You weren't supposed to play card games. You weren't supposed to go to the movie theater. <laughs> You weren't supposed to dance. These are well-intentioned things. So don't be harsh on those who were perhaps a little legalistic because they had a, probably a good heart. They wanted to follow God. They wanted to honor God, but they just went beyond his word. Same thing we see here. In an attempt to safeguard the word, we add to the word. I think a warning sign that we have fallen into the spirit of legalism is that we can get uptight. We want to obey God, but if we're uptight about it, like she seems like she could have been put her at a, uh, at a disadvantage. Now, I, I do want to be careful here because I do think, uh, I, I don't think we should get lax. I love the word holy. I think we should pursue holiness. Holiness is a beautiful term. In, in, in bodies, a beautiful concept. We're different. We should be special. We, be, we should be set apart. We should be distinctive. Those are all beautiful attributes of what holiness means. But I think we, we, we need to be careful um, 
of growing too strict or too lax. The Bible says that we do need to stay vigilant. The devil prowls around like a roaring lion. We need to be aware. And we need to live our, our convictions. We need to honor our consciences. And I think we need to be vigilant without being uptight. I think the, the one thing that really gets me in trouble is, is when I am tight or tense. Like, like when I was wrestling in high school, I loved to wrestle. And when I was in a wrestling match and, and I would grow up tight or tense, I would be, I would be easy to take down. So the, co- so the coach really got me into a, a, a method of just, okay, you got you to you be ready. You got to be tenacious, but you got to be relaxed. Be relaxed. And I think the same thing applies in our spiritual life. When we're trying to honor God, try to follow God, trying to do it right, we can't be too uptight about it. And so when we get into culture, get into society, and start, you know, trafficking with other people with different values, stay alert, but stay relaxed. Don't get uptight. We see that she gets uptight here and she really loses her balance and the serpent goes in for the takedown. Look at verse uh, verse 4 and 5. So he already uncuts the word. She overshoots the word. Now we're going to look at the serpent contradicts the word. This is full frontal assault on the word. She's tight. She's uptight. He knows she's vulnerable. He's going in for the takedown. Verse 4. But the serpent said to the woman, You will not surely die. For God knows that when you eat of it, your eyes will be opened, and you will be like God, knowing good and evil. So he gives a full on contradiction to the word of God. You will not surely die. Uh -uh. There are no consequences. God's just being petty. In fact, he's being self-seeking. He's being self-serving. He's hoarding the good stuff for himself. He doesn't have your best interests in mind. He's holding out on you. And this is crazy because, you know, God created this world and every day of it, he says, you know, and God said, and it was good. God said it was good. It was God said it was good. It was good. It was very good. He planted a garden. He puts the man in the garden. He causes trees to spring up and rivers to flow out. He had fellowship with the man. He gave the man rest. This place was lush, green, verdant, beautiful, amazing. And yet... They're made to believe that God was holding out on them. This is the nature of temptation. God has blessed you with so much, and yet he makes you think, makes you feel like you don't have enough. That you need something more, something different, something exciting. God's goodness is not good enough, but you can make it better. I'm going to show you how you can make it better. You can improve upon what God has done. So this is an assault, and not only the word of God, but on the character of God. He's not watching out for you. We can do something about that. And the tragedy is, the lie worked. So what is the response? The woman and the man sidestep the word verse 6 and 7 so when the woman saw that the tree was good for food and that it was a delight to the eyes and that the tree was be was to be desired to make one wise all good things she took of the fruit and ate and she also gave some to her her husband, who was with her, and he ate. Then the eyes of both were opened, and they knew that they were naked. They sold fig leaves together and made themselves 
loincloths. She sidestepped the word. The word of chapter 2, verse 16 and 17, she sidestepped it. And she took the fruit and she ate. And the human race began to slip out of control. But look at the reasons. People, don't, people are not stupid. She was not stupid. She did this for good reasons. She had her reasons. She saw that the, that the tree was good for food. So she's re- rationalizing. It was a delight to the eyes. It was, it was a tree to be desired to make one wise. She saw all that stuff. And she sidestepped the word. You know, temptation always starts with something good. We don't sin because it's, it's a bad thing. We sin because it's a, at least it seems like, it's a good thing. This is good. So when we're tempted, we're, we're tempted because we, we, we want to be loved. That's a good thing, right? We want to be accepted. We want to have fun. We want to experience peace. Food, rest, sex, new possibilities. This is good. And this is the reason why she endeavors in this activity. Totally forgetting about the consequence. And maybe even made to believe that there weren't any. Totally lost sight of the consequence because the sparkle and the opportunity and the possibility was too awesome. I can't miss this. And if you're being tempted today, you're being tempted because something looks good. But let me say, if you have to sidestep God's word in order to do it, don't. Anything that we, we go after, it's going to have some shine. Or else we wouldn't go after it. We're not dumb. But listen, if you have to sidestep or go around God's word to do it, don't do it. Don't lose sight of the fact that there is consequences to every decision. But the situation is unique, Demetrius. I, I, this is, nobody has faced this temptation like I have. Actually, you know, there's a, a, a great um, verse that I always love to go to. If you think you're the only one facing the temptation that you're facing, you're wrong. 1 Corinthians 10 says, temptation, no temptation has overtaken you that is not common to man. Meaning, there's nothing that's going to come your way that's not come somebody else's way before. God is faithful, though, and he will not let you be tempted beyond your ability. You hear that? God will not allow you to be tempted beyond your ability. But with the temptation, he will also provide the way of escape that you may be able to bear it. Any situation you find yourself in, any context, there's always a way of escape. And I think you can capitalize that way with, with, a, with a capital W and call it Jesus. Jesus is always right there and he will be your way of escape and look uh look at here at the end of verse six it says here and she also gave some to her husband who was with her (laughs) we didn't know adam was there this whole time silent as mouse This passive bystander? Pathetic. The man was supposed to be the leader for crying out loud, and he was there the whole time? You know, it's interesting. Talk about a sidestep. The woman sidestepped the word, but the man, oh, man. You know, the Bible says in uh, 1 Timothy 2, Romans 5, that the woman had to be tricked. But the man, he just willfully sinned. Talk about sidestepping. He, 
He totally witnessed that whole thing and he went around the word of God. Willful disobedience. I think he has more of the blame because he did it knowingly. The husband is supposed to be the spiritual leader of the home. And there's a book uh, published some time ago called The Silence of Adam. Larry Crabb. Great title. The Silence of Adam. And that's what we see right here. And sometimes that's a tendency men can have. We get scared or something because we get, we get quiet. We don't do anything. We, we become inactive. And, and yet the man is supposed to be the one who's leading charge. And so if you're a husband today, you, you need to take the lead. You need to be the spiritual leader. You need to be one, the one having the conversations. You need to be praying. You need to be down with your kids. You need to be reading the Bible. You need to be leading yourself and leading your family. That's your role. You don't want to be fall, fall culprit to the silence of Adam. That would be a crying shame. No, 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 no. Take the lead. Don't stand idly by. Then finally here in verse 7, we have the aftermath. Both of their eyes were opened, just like the serpent said they would be. That's what he said right here, right? Uh, verse 4, I believe. Yeah, he says, your eyes will be opened and you will be like God. And so the eyes were open here down in verse 5. Oh, excuse me. Verse 7. The eyes were opened and they knew that they were naked. <laughs> so yes, their knowledge expanded. Their eyes were open, but the promise of being like God was actually just shameful nakedness. They were duped. They were, they, they were hooked and baited. Baited and hooked. Because they sidestepped the word of God. So, <coughs> what does the devil do? In this whole narrative, okay, we're, we're studying game film. What does the devil do? He, would you hit that next slide there, undercuts and contradicts. This is his meth methods. These are his tactics. This is what he employs. He undercuts the word and he contradicts the word. These are direct assaults on this thing right here. His assault is going to be on this. More so than on you, he's going to do this. Because this means everything to us. And if he can throw a wedge in between this and us, he's got you where he wants you. You got you to be like this with the Bible, with the Word of God. You can't let anything separate you from the promise of God. So he's going to do a direct assault on the Word. So, so that's what the serpent does. But what do people do? What do people do? They, and you can sh show that next slide, they overshoot. And they, and they sidestep. They miss it. These are indirect misses. The serpent does, he, does these direct assaults on the word. People do these indirect misses. So the devil, he's trying his best to get you off point. That's the way he takes us down the wrong path. He's trying to get you off of this word right here. And that's why you need to have a thorough going knowledge of God's word. And you have to have a total trust in his goodness. One of my favorite verses in the Bible is uh, Proverbs 3, 5 and 6. Trust in the Lord with all your heart. And if you find yourself in, in some form of temptation today. Memorize that verse. Trust in the Lord with all your heart. Lean not to your own understanding. I know it's hard. In all your ways, acknowledge 
God and he will direct you. He will direct your paths. He will make your path straight. So please, know the word of God. Trust his character. What you do with the word will by and large determine how you will handle your temptation. But what about if you have already fallen into temptation? What if you're dealing with the consequences of the temptation? What if you have already taken and eaten? You know, those are the, those are the worst words in human history. She took and she ate. It, it's what plunged us into our current situation. She took and she ate. And I find it interesting, as dreadful as those two words are, that Jesus should use those same two words when he said, take, eat, this is my body, broken for you, do this in remembrance of me. Those very two verbs that plunged us into disaster are the very two words that open us up to a whole new world. Take and eat. That's a beautiful reversal. The agony of defeat in those two words became the thrill of victory in Jesus Christ. The hope today is you don't have to. You're tempted. But you don't have to. And if you already have, you don't have to stay there. Jesus has provided a way out. But you need to take and eat. You need Jesus. He's the only way out. Let me pray, and then we'll sing one last song. But this is not a happy text. This is a terrible text. But we know the context for this text is very good. He spends the rest, God spends the rest of the book getting us out of what happened right here. And it's a process. It's a process. But it is a beautiful process. Thing that Jesus has done. He came. They tried to sow fig leaves. They covered up their shame and their nakedness. And that's the worst thing about sin is that you have to deal with shame. You have to deal with, oh, what have I done? I'm ugly. I'm distorted. I'm bent. And they try to cover it up themselves. But yet Jesus presents his own blood as a covering for sin. And not only does it cover sin, but it cleanses sin. Forgiveness, redemption, grace. So, Father, thank you for not abandoning us in the garden. When we took our fall, you did not walk away. We thank you that you sent your Son who came and took our place, paid our penalty so that we can experience forgiveness restoration that one day we're going back to a place that's even better than it was in Genesis 1 and 2 Revelation 21 and 22 is far greater than Genesis 1 and 2 you can take disaster and you can make beauty out of ashes that's the kind of God you are God you are you're faithful when we are faithless you remain faithful and we love and praise you for that forever and ever. Thank you, Jesus, for being our Savior. When we stand to our feet, sing this last.